I always get excited at this time of the week. It's time now to get a take on the news from the left, right, and middle. With us today are Thomas Basili from Forbes Magazine and award-winning journalist Karen Hunter. Welcome to both of you. Hello. All right, Tom, you're new in this ring, I mean table. Right. Uh, so welcome to the show. Glad Thank to have you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. So let's get going, okay? We're going to talk about three things. Want to hear your perspective on this. Let's start with then the uh, judge's ruling. Shira Scheindlin said that with stop and frisk, uh, that thousands of people's, if not millions, thousands of people's civil rights were violated in the way the New York City Police Department uh, implemented this policy. I'll start with you since you're the guest here. Okay. Uh, it's what's, he's what's new. Your, <laughs> only because you're new. No. Uh, what's your take on this ruling and was it the right decision? Look, stop and frisk has been with us for a very long time. It predates the, the Bloomberg administration and it was part of a suite of proactive policing tools that helped make this city one of the safest large cities in the country. That being said, it, it's, it should have been very apparent to this administration that there were problems with the implementation of this program. Uh, so, you know, it, it did take over 6,000 uh, illegal weapons off the streets of the city of New York, and there were 25,000 arrests last year as, uh, as a result of it. So, you know, I, I disagree often with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, mayoral candidates who say, you know, let's just throw it out the window. I think the, the process needs to be reformed. And, uh, and uh, you know, the judge took a, took a step in, in, in the right direction toward that. Yeah, and I actually agree with you. You're wonderful. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, I don't but, like but, this. No, no, no. Oh, but the problem, the pro <laughs> but, but Debbie, the problem is not stop and frisk. The problem is who's stopping and frisking. The problem is the culture of the NYPD, the culture of the NYPD that does predate Bloomberg, where there seems to be open season on young black males in the city. If, if we want to go there, which I think we should, all the way back to Diallo, Dorisman, you know, we can go down the list, Sean Bell of... of targeting black males in a way that costs lives. We don't see this in white neighborhoods, Thomas, where people, uh, just cops, you know, go open fire, you know, in a neighborhood 50, 60, 30 times and, and you well, know. Let me ask well, you this, and I hear what you say, that this has been a useful tool, it's been the way it's implemented mm -hmm. so that reform is necessary, but is it possible for this de police, police department in this city to enforce an initiative like this? Isn't this one of these cases, I wonder, where you do throw the baby out with the bath? Water. Uh, you, you, you can actually, and 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 look, I, I am one of these people who believes that uh, starting from the standpoint or the opinion that the the city police force is fundamentally uh, racist is is not a good starting point for how we're going to keep this city safe, particularly in neighborhoods where you've got you know who you, you, ask yourself this question: Who is this policy designed to help protect? It was designed to help protect the woman, the grandmother who lives in the housing project, who's riding the elevator alone, who's, Tom, who's, walking that st who's walking the street. I'm just going to uh, sit no, back because no, no, here mean, comes Karen. You know, I mean, <laughs> this is nice rhetoric and, it, and, it, and it's, it makes for great sound bites, but at the end of the day, you know, the reality is the, the police department is inherently racist. And if we don't start from that premise and work backwards to try to fix it, then we're going to have this problem. Sure, grandma coming home from, from work should be protected, but the reality is grandma's grandson is being stopped three and four times under the stop and frisk law for doing absolutely nothing. And you criminalize this kid into thinking that now this is normal. You know what I'm saying? So there's a problem here I, that needs to be eradicated I, from the top down. I think that when, when the judge says that just because most of these stops, and look, the facts are the facts, most of these stops do not lead to an arrest or, or a summons, for her to say that that means that these cops are not acting with reasonable suspicion is judicial activism, the likes of which that we don't need in this city. All right, I'm going to stop it right there because we have a couple other things that we want to talk about. Uh, maybe we'll get to at least one, one of the things. Of course, Eric Holder announced a, a reform to uh, uh, the sentencing guidelines for drug offenders, uh, probably bringing to an end of what we have called the era of the war on drugs. Was this an announcement, a, con a concession, uh, that we lost this war? Start with you, Kate. Oh, yes, the, the <laughs> war. The, but it was not just a war on drugs. Or was it the it, wrong war? It, it, no, it was not a war on drugs. Because if you were having a war on drugs, you would stop them from coming in in the first place. The people you arrested, 200,000 people in federal prison, 60% of whom have mandatory sentences, most of whom are African American and Hispanic, with little, little just minute amount of drugs. You know, you're, you're saying something quite different than I'm having a war when you stop the planes from coming in, stop the boats from coming in. That's a war. What they're doing is cleansing. Mm. Look, ethnic cleansing. I said it. First of all, first of all, 
<laughs> most of the, first of all, most of the, um, uh, these drugs, uh, these, these drug prosecutions happen at the state level. They do not happen at the federal level. Only 13% of the U.S. prison population is in, is in federal prison, and only a very small percentage of that population are in, that, in those prisons because of drug offenses. So this is actually getting some bipartisan support. You've got Republicans that are saying, you know what, we're spending $21,000 a year per person to keep, these, to keep a, a lot of these kids in, in jail when we should be focusing on, on rehabilitation. But what really the administration is doing here isn't changing anything that fundamental. They're giving the states cover to try and legalize marijuana. And, and I was they're, gonna say, you know, that, next, that's really what frontier. the next step is. And, and, and it's right. But even if, you know, I think what, what this says, it sends a message. More so than having teeth, this sends a message that we're no longer going to police in a way, and it goes back to the stop and frisk as well, police in a way that we always used to. And I think it was an important message coming from this administration that we're now going to back away from some of the things that I think have criminalized people who did not deserve but to be But then criminal. the question is, how do we take these kids who are dealing drugs and who are on drugs, and how do we give them some skin in the game? How do we give them a better life? And that's something that we're not hearing from this administration in any way. Well, he's working on well, that. What, how, what would the, well, since you brought that up, <laughs> we waiting. just have a few seconds. <laughs> we just have a few seconds left, but what would the administration do in in that regard, because I agree with you, it's really about it's it's about uh, therapy and changing the environment, that kind of thing. What does the government do? Yeah, you know, look, you know, we have an African American population in this country that is ignored by one political party and taken advantage of by the other, and that is the that's the the cultural thing that needs to stop in terms of our politics. You know, we've got these kids don't have skin in the game. They've got failing schools. They don't have opportunity, in, uh, economic opportunity. They're living in substandard housing, and they don't have jobs. And this administration has to get on the ball. Thomas Basile, thank you very much. Karen Hunter, always good to see you. You're so nice. I don't know if we can have you back. You're so agreeable. <laughs> we do appreciate it, though. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow for Arise America. Bye-bye.